So we'll just get started here in one minute, and we'll jump right in. Just bear with me for one more minute, guys. Alrighty guys, so we're going to go right ahead and uh, get started here. So, like I said, my name is James Romelli. We're going to record the session here, so if you guys have to leave early for any reason, uh, you will be getting a recording later on. Um, we're going to talk today about reading order flow in the equity options market to find unusual options activity. How many of you guys have never ever heard that term before, unusual options activity? Have never once heard it on TV, read about it online, seen it in the Wall Street Journal? I've seen it on uh, marketwatch.com or cnbc.com or Bloomberg. Here to, uh, heard it talked about on CNBC, on TV, on Bloomberg TV, on Fox. Has anybody never heard of unusual options activity? A couple of people saying that they haven't, but I wouldn't would be pretty surprised if more than just a few of you said that you were completely unfamiliar with this topic because it's something that's become a lot more prevalent, particularly in the media over the past couple of years here because we've had a lot of very high profile cases of insider trading going down and unusual options activity is oftentimes the way that insider traders put on their insider trades. So we're going to talk a little bit about that and uh, how the strategy isn't entirely based on finding those who are trading with information they're not supposed to have, but how we also um, can use unusual options activity for a host of other things as well, not just trying to find those who are out there, quote unquote, cheating or uh, taking trades that they're using information um, uh, to, uh, to use. All right? So, Let's jump right in here. Day trading, short term trading, options trading, and futures trading are extremely risky undertakings. They generally are not appropriate for someone with limited capital, little or no trading experience, and or a low tolerance for risk. Never execute a trade unless you can't afford to and are prepared to lose your entire investment. All trading operations involve serious risks and you can lose your entire investment. No trades or recommendations or advice and we cannot be sued for losses of capital. All trades are for educational purposes only. Please contact your broker or registered investment advisor for execution margin and all other capital requirement questions. Everyone watching this presentation Here's to all disclaimers on Option Hacker. So my name is James Romelli. I'm a trader and moderator here at KeenOnTheMarket.com. 98% of my training is in equity options and the underlying stocks that I trade around those options, but I do occasionally trade some of these other products as well. Um, I'm on TV relatively often, um, at least once a week. <clears throat> on either CNBC, Bloomberg, Fox Business, or BNN Canada. So if you've seen me on TV, now you can uh, <laughs> hear me talk for a little bit longer. And if not, maybe you've read something that I've written. I read for Futures Magazine, Active Trader Magazine, Resource Investor Magazine, and I've written for CME Open Markets Magazine as well. Oops, whoops. So our presentations all kind of go uh, along the same uh, formula. And what we're going to do is we're going to kind of talk about why we care about unusual options activity. Then we're going to talk about what unusual options activity is and how to identify it. And then we're going to talk about a trading plan that we have written to then take advantage of these orders coming across the tape and turn them into actionable trading ideas. Okay, so the whole idea behind the unusual options activity trading plan and behind following unusual options activity is that I want to trade not like a retail trader, but more like a institutional trader, right? There's a difference between a professional trader and an institutional trader. A professional trader is someone who trades for a living. I'm sure many of you in here would consider yourselves professional traders because that's what you do for a living. But none of you in here are, at least unless someone from Goldman Sachs is in here uh, trying to brush up on their UOA, are probably not going to be institutional traders. Now, regardless of whether or not you consider yourself a pro, 90% of all retail traders lose money in the long run who are actively trading equity options, okay? It's very, very difficult as a retail trader to make money 
in the long run, the average lifespan of a retail trading account is only 18 months. So that tells me that there's something that is going against the retail trader, right? The institutional traders, they don't really have that type of statistic. Most institutions are making money. In fact, there's some institutions out there that haven't had a single losing trading day in years, and more than just a year or two, but like five or six years, an options desk in an institution that has traded every single day has not has had a losing trading day. So what do you guys think is the cause <clears throat> of that discrepancy? Well, <clears throat> I believe that emotion and the way that that plays into the game for an institutional trader and a retail trader, uh, it's very different and I think that has a big part, uh, a big effect on why the differences in success between the two are so wide. Paul Tudor Jones once said that the key to trading success is emotional discipline. If you don't know who Paul Tudor Jones is, go ahead and um, uh, look him up. He's one of the best traders in the entire world, multi-billionaire, incredibly successful hedge fund guy. But is it just that he has his emotions more in check than anyone else on Wall Street? Do you guys think that's why he's so successful? Or does he have some other advantages behind him? So let's talk a little bit about institutional edge and what drives institutional edge, and if I'm just you know, hopelessly lost and can't ever hope to compete on their level, is that the case, is that not the case? So the main driver, ooh, I hate that color, the main driver of institutional edge, sorry, I uh, wanna change it to something I can actually see. The main driver of institutional edge is their access to capital. Okay, they have more capital than I do. That capital gives them access to more capital. Believe it or not, the more money you have, the more cheaply you can buy money. And it also gives them access to these three things above here, manpower, technology, and information. Okay, now information is the first on the list here because it is the most important. And we all should, if the, everything is going the way that it should and everyone's following the rules, have the same amount of information as the institutional trader, or at least the ability to access the same amount of information as the institutional trader. Does anyone in here, however, believe that institutional traders strictly trade on only public information, or is there a fair amount of insider trading going on? What do you guys think the answer to that question is? Is there a lot of insider trading happening on institutional trading desks? Is there only a little bit? Does it not happen too often? Someone says with stocks, yes. Someone says a lot. I would agree with that second statement and I would say yes, a lot. I think there is a lot of insider trading. And as we go through some examples here uh, later on in the presentation, you guys will see uh, my point illustrated even more. But let's, let's take that part of the equation out for a second. Let's assume that institutional traders only have access to public information and none of them are taking information or tips that they got from the country club where they play golf with vice presidents of Kraft who told them that deal was coming through or the um, you know VP at Jana Capital who says, hey, we're going to be put it, taking a big stake in ConAgra. Let's assume that that doesn't happen. We all know that it does. The information that they have is able to be analyzed at a much higher level than I can ever hope to do because of the manpower and technology that they can afford with the capital that they have behind them. How many hours a week do you guys think you spend outside of trading hours, outside of market hours, doing research, reading articles, looking at charts, looking at financial statements, looking at um, other types of technical indicators, you know, doing any type of quote unquote research or homework to help better improve your trading. How many hours do you guys think you spend outside of the market hours during the week? What do you guys think? Someone just shot out some numbers. Five hours, 10 hours, 20 hours, 15 hours, two hours, no time at all. How many hours outside of the regular market hours doing that type of research, doing that type of extra work? Right, some people are saying three or four hours, five hours. 10, so it's 15 to 20, 5, 6, right, so it's all over the map, right? Some of you are able to spend a lot more time than others. Some of you are spending five times as much time as some of the other respondents are saying that they spend. But no matter what, even if you spend every single waking minute that you have outside of market hours doing research on 
whatever information you can get your hands on, you are never, ever, ever going to be able to do as much work or research or analysis as a desk full of 12 PhDs um, from Harvard can do at a hedge fund. And that's basically who options traders are competing against in the equity options market. So what does that mean? Does that mean that since I don't have access to any of these things that I'm just hopelessly lost and there's no way I can compete with them. Well, the end result of all of this work, all of this analysis is still just going to be a trade, right? It's still a trading strategy. All right, I will look that over. So if I can get this, which is the end result, does it really matter that I don't have access to any of this stuff? If I can identify the end result of all this work, information coming in, trades coming out, if I can catch the trades that come out of institutional traders, does it really matter that I don't have any of this type of information? No, it really doesn't because I've taken the end result of all of their hard work, right? So all that we're going to be talking about today is how I can identify this, the institutional order flow that comes through and what order flow is relevant to me as a retail equity options trader, okay? So <clears throat> this is where we enter into unusual options activity. Unusual options activity is a window into institutionals, institutional risk and where the big smart money is putting all of their risk capital. Okay, it's in my mind the best way to read order flow and money flow in the market because it doesn't have a lot of the caveats that the stock market has in terms of dark pools and other things like that. But we're going to talk about that a little bit more um, a little bit later on here. Okay, so unusual options activity is an order that is above the average daily options volume in a given stock, okay? So these are the orders that I'm trying to find. I'm trying to find orders that are unusually large for a given stock, and that gives me insight into institutional order flow. But to understand why I care about this order flow, or why this order flow is important to me, we have to talk about the order process a little bit. So <laughs> we've already establish that institutions at least at the very least have better analysis methods for their information right they have a lot of people working on this stuff they can do more work than I can I'm only going to be one person I'm always going to be limited at the very least by that fact all right so let's also consider the fact that they do sometimes have insider information but all that work and all that time produces one thing and that is a trading strategy so once they have their strategy in mind and they know what it is that they want to do they're gonna call their broker to get the trade executed all right their broker is then gonna shop this order all over the place to different types of trading desks: Citadel Goldman Sachs Barclays Citigroup JP Morgan um, any big equity options market maker and they're gonna to try to get their customers order filled all right if none of those desks want to take that order then they'll send it to the pit and market makers in the pit can trade it if they still can't get the order filled then the broker has a question that they have to ask themselves do they want to execute the trade and hedge on behalf of the, uh, their customer just to keep their customer happy or do they want to tell their customer sorry no trade we couldn't get you a fill well odds are they're going to come in and tell their uh, customer that they're going to fill their order for them. But what's important to understand is that at no point throughout this process do they have the ability to send this order flow to a dark pool. Okay? Does anybody know what a dark pool is? Does anyone know what a dark pool is? Is anyone else having issues hearing me? It, it seems like there's several... Um, uh, it seems like several um, uh, people are, are saying they're having trouble with the sound. Is I mean, has it sounded okay? Is it coming in and out? Is it choppy? It sounds okay? All right. So several people say, no, I have no idea what a dark pool is. A dark pool is a center of liquidity that is off of a public exchange. <clears throat> okay? So, Ryan, let's say that I, I own 100,000 shares of Apple and that I want to sell it and that you want to buy it. Well, I don't want to sell my stock in the open market. I don't like the market that I see there. Well, we, me and you come to an agreement, and we will then execute our trade together off of the exchange, right? It's completely legal, and in fact, most equity volume now happens off of the exchange. So when you see a price movement on the chart that you watch in Thinkorswim or in any other platform, you're looking at quotes coming from the stock exchange. 
you're looking at volume coming from the stock exchange. Most of that volume is not really going to be telling me what's truly representative of the total volume that trades in a day because most institutional volume goes through dark pools. Options do not have dark pools. Citadel down the street from our office here in Chicago will trade more stock during the first hour of trading day in their of the trading day in their dark pool than the New York Stock Exchange will trade all day long. Okay? So all options orders though must be routed to public exchanges. The CBOE, the Philex, BSX, right? All of these options exchanges, there's about a dozen of them in the U.S., must provide to the public, to the trading public, all pertinent and relevant information with this order. So as an institutional trader, I can hide my stock trading fairly easily and fairly effectively by routing orders to, through dark pools. As an institutional options trader, I do not have that ability. So what does that tell you guys? It tells you guys that no matter what, I'm able to see all of the institutional order flow <coughs> coming through the equity options market. So it gives me the clearest view as to where they are putting their risk capital because I can't follow them in the stock market. The futures market is also too difficult. Equity options give me the best view on where institutional risk capital is going. All right. So what does this actually look like? So this is an example of a alert that comes across over the scanner that we use. There's a lot of different scanners out there. We have one of our own. This is one called Trade Alert. Okay. This is one called Trade Alert. Now, Trade Alert spits out the, <clears throat> this information, but Option Hacker and Thinkorswim will give you all of the same stuff. Options Flux, which is another scanner, will give you all of the same stuff. And that's because the exchange is required to record and report this information. And there's a lot of information that I can get about every single trade that comes across the tape in a day. Right? I can see the time that it was traded. I can see whether it was bought or sold. Uh, the size of the trade, the stock that it traded in, the expiration, the strike price, whether it was a call or a put, the price it traded at, the bid and offer at the time of the trade, whether it was an opening or closing position, and where the stock was trading when the option trade took place. Okay. Now, there's a lot of information here, a ton of information. I notice some things right away, and the first thing that I notice is what? This is a very large trade. 5,000 contracts at $1.08 is a $540,000 bet. Now, that is not the size that you would expect a trader sitting at home in their basement in their pajamas to be trading. So I know that this is an institutional player that is coming in and putting this type of trade on. All right, so it automatically piques my interest, and then I can look a little bit further. And this is what's really great about unusual options activity is there's so much information for me to analyze. I can see that the market at the time of the trade was 90 cents at 105. So the best offer in the world was $1.05. And even though that was the best offer in the world at the time of this trade, the trader paid $1.08. So it shows me what? They were very aggressive. They aggressively bought these calls. They paid through the market maker's offer to make sure that they got filled on their entire trade. And they did. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about this example here and we'll see what happened. So this trade hit the tape shortly after the open about a month ago, exactly a month ago. How about that? ConAgra ripped higher after these calls hit the tape and this trader saw an enormous profit in just a few minutes. This is a stock that have, has traded well on unusual option activity in the past, so we knew it would be a pretty decent setup. So take a look at how the stock traded after the order hit the tape. We know that it came across around 19 minutes into the trading day. so in this third bar, in this uh, fourth bar here, and that the stock was right around 38.29 when this order hit the tape. So boom, this is where they bought calls. And look at what happened to the stock. The stock ripped higher, sold off, and then just kind of you know gently rallied into the close. But this trader made a lot of money in this position very, very quickly. Okay, these calls ripped higher, exploded in value as the stock moved higher and traded as high as $1.70 in that session, meaning that this trader made a huge profit in just a very short amount of time. If I would have bought a 20 lot of these calls, I, a trader could have profited $1,240 on $2,160 in risk. And now that $2,160 in risk is not actually 
um, you know, the level of risk that I'm required to take in this position. It is, however, the risk that I would be taking if I were to allow these to go to zero. We're going to talk about stop losses uh, a little bit later on once we dive into the actual trading plan part of the presentation here. But that's better than 57% profits in under an hour for this trader. Can I ever expect to get returns like that day trading stock? on one trade during the day. Can I ever expect to get term returns like that, an ROI like that? What do you guys think? Maybe if I'm trading penny stocks to trade on the pink sheets and you know, are uh, in the middle of a pump and dump uh, situation, then maybe that I could in that case. But trading stock, trading futures, am I ever able to get that type of return that quickly? No, I'm not. All right, and this is what is really great about um, unusual options activity is that options themselves are a leveraged product. They have an inherent amount of leverage that um, you know helps positions really gain in value quite a bit very quickly if moves happen. All right, but we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, this here. We have another example. Um, if you take a look here, this wasn't the end of this story, right? This wasn't the end of the ConAgra story. The stock ripped higher on the 16th when these calls were bought, but then three days later on the 19th, traders came in <clears throat> and bought the stock up huge on the announcement that Janet Capital was going to be taking a 7% stake in ConAgra. Now, let me ask you guys this. Do you guys think that the trader that bought on this day or maybe it was this day, the trader that bought these out-of-the-money calls on this day, do you think that they just got lucky that this move happened, or did they know that this deal was going to be announced? What do you guys think is the most likely scenario? I know what I think is most likely. <laughs> do you guys think that he knew, or do you think that he got lucky? Right? I don't see anybody answering saying that this person got lucky or that they didn't know that this deal was coming through. Okay? And this is what unusual option activity looks like in its you know absolutely finest form. M&A deals oftentimes have this type of activity ahead of them, right? We uh, used to cite this study, and I um, was uh, written about pretty extensively by Andrew Ross Sorkin. Um, it was done about a year and a half ago. And a study was done, and it showed that ahead of merger and acquisitions, the options market tends to see some type of unusual activity in the name in the stocks that are going to be part of the deal about 25% of the time ahead of the deal okay so that goes to tell you think about all of the M&A that happens in a year think about all the t of the M&A that um, uh, comes through the pipeline throughout the year 25% of the time so one out of every four of those deals we will see some type of telegraphing unusual options activity before the announcement is actually made. Okay, so this obviously became went from a very nice winner to an absolutely huge winner on the on this announcement. These options have traded as high as six bucks since then. So a buyer of a twenty lot of those calls would now be up ninety eight hundred and forty dollars in this position, or at the highs would be up ninety eight hundred and forty dollars in this position on less than uh, twenty two hundred dollars in risk. Okay, now I don't want you guys to think that this is the typical result of every unusual options activity trade because it's not. All right, not every single trade is going to go down like this. All right, it's not always going to happen where we see an option increase in value by five or six times. But that first example, that first day moving Conagra, that's the type of thing that we see all of the time. All right, because as options are sold in giant blocks, market makers have to trade the stock against them to hedge themselves, and it kind of creates an internal dynamic that drives stock prices in the direction that are favorable for the option buyer. All right, but we're going to talk a little bit more about that here as um, uh, we get into the actual trading plan. So let's look at one more example here in Craft. Uh, okay, let's look at one more example here in Craft. So on March 10th, a trader bought 10,000 of the Craft. June 67 half calls for 70 cents, okay? So this um, happened on the 10th of March, right? About two and a half weeks go by, and the announcement is made that um, Kraft and Heinz are going to merge 
form one of the largest food conglomerates in the world, and that Kraft was going to pay a massive, massive special dividend to all of their shareholders, and the stock explodes to the upside. Now, this trader put on a $700,000 bet in Kraft, so we automatically know that this was an institutional trader, right? We know that this was an institutional guy. This wasn't some small fish um, out there you know, putting on a trade with a couple thousand dollars in risk, $700,000 bet, all right? Since then, the options have traded as high as 2270. So on a 20 lot, that is a $44,000 profit. On a 10,000 lot, that is a $22 million profit. And I, some people are already saying, already saying in the chat box here, yeah, this guy knew, right? This guy knew what was going down. This guy did not have uh, any luck about this. I mean, how often do you guys think there are $700,000 derivatives bets being made in Kraft? Does Kraft strike you guys as a stock that uh, would see this type of activity very often? No, it's not. It absolutely is not. This order stuck out like a sore thumb. Members of our trading room got into this position, and actually uh, Andrew, our head trader, had a uh, position in this for a long time and made a ton of money in these calls, a ton of money, right? So this is why we care about unusual options activity, okay? This is why we care about unusual options activity. And that's a great question, Barb. I'm gonna talk about that in a second. So they get in trouble for doing this stuff when they have insider information, but not nearly as many of them get caught as get away with it, all right? So someone says, where is the SEC in this case? Where is the SEC in ConAgra? Well, do you guys think that generally speaking, most insider trading gets discovered or most people committing insider trading get caught? Or do most of them get away with it? Yeah, no, most of them get away with it. The SEC has an incredibly large backlog of cases. They're still going through stuff from 2008. Yeah, they're, they're still going through stuff from 2008. They have a huge backlog, right? By the time they get around to investigating this, it might be years later, and figuring out who knew what when and who had what information when, when said transactions were you know, placed, it's really, really difficult for them to, to unwind all of that, right? And, you know, they do this knowing that they could get caught, but also knowing that if they do get caught, they're probably just going to have to pay a fine, right? They're not going to go to jail. No one's going to jail for this. They're going to pay a fine. They're ready to pay the fine. But they also know that they're probably not going to get caught. So, you know, why do we care about unusual options activity? Let's take away all of the insider trading talk for just one second and consider the fact that the information that they have and the information that they are basing their decisions on is still going to be of a better quality than I can get access to. They just have more access. just how it works, okay? This is, this is just how it works. Someone says, you can't play every unusual option activity trade. How do you choose? Yep, we're going to get to that in a second, Jack. The very next slide, we're going to start talking about the actual trading plan. Okay. So they have more information than us. They have better analysis for that information, right? And, you know, I truly believe that the vast, vast, vast majority, I mean, the, you know, super majority of institutional traders out there are honest hard-working people that don't use insider information, but I can still benefit from the order flow that I see from them, right? It's like being able to see what Carl Icahn, David Einhorn, Dan, Dan Loeb, uh, Bill Ackman are doing before they actually disclose their positions to the general public. A lot of these activist investor guys use the options market as a way to get a foothold in a stock before they actually build up their you know big position that they're trying to get that they're trying to get to, right? So add back in the potential for big, huge winners like we see there in Kraft and ConAgra, and we have an incredibly powerful source of information to base trades on. And what's really great about unusual options activity is that even if a trade is being placed by an institutional trader using information that he isn't supposed to have, he or she is not supposed to have, as soon as they click the mouse and place the trade, well, they've broken the law and they've done something wrong. If they get caught, they're going to have to answer for, you know, breaking the law and they're going to have to pay the consequences, whether it's going to jail or paying a fine. But if me, as a retail trader, is, dil is just diligently watching the tape and looking for that type of suspicious, unusual order flow, if I'm able to recognize what it looks like, 
Well, as soon as that order hits the tape, it becomes part of public the public record. It becomes part of public information, and I can use it to do whatever I want. And I will never, ever, ever get a phone call from the SEC saying, "Hey, how did you know to buy Humana calls three se you know three minutes before the stock was halted and they announced they were putting themselves up for sale? How did you know to do that? No one's that lucky." And I can say, well, hey, you know what? You're exactly right. And there probably was someone doing some insider trading here, but all I did was I caught his order flow coming across the tape. Okay? All I did was catch his order flow coming across the tape and followed along with it. And I've done nothing wrong. Okay? <laughs> because the guys at the SEC are also getting paid off. Ah, well, you know, I don't like to dive too far into theories like that, but the reality of, of, of trading is that Insider trading happens a lot, happens way more often than any of us would probably like to think about, but just because they're not playing fair doesn't mean that I can't benefit from the information that I can glean from their order flow. Okay, so let's take a look at another example here. And this example is from is a little bit more recent than the ConAgra example. It's about two weeks old, and it was a trade that came across in MBI. And MBI is a company that has a lot of exposure to uh, particularly Puerto Rican bonds. <clears throat> They're a uh, debt insurer, right? So it's a stock that has been very much in focus, and we've seen some order flow in it. But we saw a big order coming across the tape in MBI in the July 8 puts that were bought for $0.31. Cents. So what are the things that I start to notice about this right away? Well, I can see that the order happened late in the day, right into the close. And I can see that this trader paid <clears throat> paid the offer to get into this trade when the offer was five cents wide, or when the market was five cents wide. So they didn't try to work anything in between. They said, you know what? I'm going to buy these. I'm going to get long. Now, how do I? And I actually bought. I bought these puts, and I made a lot of money in this trade. But how did I know that I wanted to take this trade? What about this particular signal coming across the tape was so attractive to me? Okay, what made it, it an actionable idea for me? Well, we use the Oak Ribbit trading plan to determine what orders are actionable and what orders are, you know, quote unquote noise. So the first thing that I want to look at is volume versus open interest. So I need to make sure that I'm only getting into opening positions, right? I only want to be getting into opening positions. I don't want to be getting into a position as a trader is exiting. Because keep in mind, anytime an option is bought, that could be a trader exiting their position. They could be buying back options that they were short. All right? So I either need to see this labeled as opening, and most exchanges will label opening orders as opening. They're not always labeled as such, though. But one way that I can check and tell very easily is to look at the open interest. So think about this logically. If a trader is buying 2,119 of these puts and the open interest is 1,924, is it at all possible that this trade is closing? No, it is not. Okay, it's not possible. Think about that logically. If open interest is 5,000 and I see 10,000 out of the money calls being bought in a stock, it's not possible for that to be a closing trade because there isn't 10,000 options for there for them to close. They can't exit that trade if there's not the you know the size there for them to exit. Right? So I know that it's opening. So if volume is less than open interest, I don't want to um, take the trade because there's a much higher chance that the trade is closing. If volume is um, uh, less than open interest but the trade is labeled opening, well, then I can still take the trade if I want to. But it's not going to be as strong of a signal. Typically, I want to see volume as large as I possibly can over open interest because it makes the order flow more significant. So what's more, what's more significant of an order? 20,000 calls being bought against open interest of 15,000 calls or 5,000 calls being bought against open interest of zero? Well, the order that is more significant is the 5,000 calls being bought against open interest of zero. Well, luckily, this trade was labeled opening, so I, I know that I can move on to the next step right away. I don't need to um, uh, look at volume versus open interest because it's labeled as opening. Now, if it wasn't, then I would have to check. The second part of the Oak Ribbit trading plan, and Oak Ribbit is an acronym. It's an uh, acronym for our trading plan here. O stands for open interest. C stands for chart. If you have a suggestion for a more eloquent name for the trading plan, we're all ears. But the chart helps me determine whether or not an order is a speculative bet or a hedge. 
Now, there are two main types of participants in the equity options market, speculators and hedgers. Speculators come in and they buy and sell equity options in order to speculate on moves in the stock, either moves directionally, moves in implied volatility, they bet on time, they can bet on a lot of different things, but they're speculating, they have no underlying position in the stock. Hedgers use equity options, they buy and sell equity options to protect themselves against unfavorable moves in the underlying stock. So what type of order flow do you guys think I care about if I'm watching unusual options activity? Am I trying to follow hedgers or am I trying to follow speculators? What am I trying to follow? Yes, exactly, AL, speculators. I care about the speculative order flow, okay? Because the hedger comes in and buys an equity option, right? He buys that equity option with the expectation and the full hope that that position goes to zero, right? Because if it goes to zero, then it means that his underlying position that he was hedging is much in much better shape, right? It didn't move against him. So I want to find the speculative order flow. And the best way to do this, because I can never know without, you know, uh, a, a shadow of a doubt that an order is a hedge or a speculative bet, but I can get pretty darn close by using this analysis method. So I, what I want to use is I want to use the chart, the daily chart of a stock, and what I want to use as an indicator is the Ichimoku cloud. Okay, so the Ichimoku cloud will help me determine if the stock is trading in bullish or bearish territory on a chart. All right, because the Ichimoku cloud helps read trend. If I see a stock in bearish territory and I see calls being bought, is it more likely that a trader is speculating to the upside or hedging a short stock position? If I see a stock on a new 52 week high and I see huge blocks of puts being bought, what's more likely in that scenario do you guys think? Is it more likely that a trader is coming in and speculating on a big move lower at a stock that just made new highs or are they protecting some of the long stock that they have? Right? It's a lot more likely that they're protecting the long stock that they have. So let's take a look at a chart in MBI here and see if we can determine whether or not this order was a speculative bet or a hedge. Now, what we can see right away is that MBI, on the day that they bought these puts, was breaking through some support levels at the downside here, right? Breaking through support. We also know that we're below the cloud here. Anything trading below the cloud is in bearish territory. Anything trading above it is in bullish territory. If you take only one thing away from this presentation, make it that, right? It's the best, anal best fastest analysis method for determining trend and strength of trend out there. The Ichimoku cloud, it's amazing. I use it in everything that I do, okay? But they came in and bought these puts as the stock was breaking down, as we're getting more and more news about Greece. This is when the situation really kind of started to catalyze and, and, and get a lot worse. And we're just starting to hear uh, the beginnings of what is a, appearing to be a bigger and bigger crisis in Puerto Rico. And with their uh, municipal debt, okay? So I know that this, um, uh, when is this supposed to end? I, uh, I, you know, will probably be going for about another uh, 20 minutes or so. There's gonna be a recording sent out, Ed, so if you, if, you know, if you wanna watch the recording later, that, that's totally fine if you have to run out right now. But um, uh, <clears throat> I knew that with all of that going on and the stock breaking down to the downside here, and also keep in mind that, you know, this is a stock that was $10 two weeks beforehand and now it's trading, you know, uh, below nine, huge, huge move lower. What's more likely here? Is a trader coming in here and putting on a big bet, trying to fade the move here, trying to catch the knife as it's falling? Or is this a trader coming in and betting with the momentum of the market? What do you guys think institutions do more often? Do you think they're more so trying to catch the knife or do you think they're more so trying to bet with the momentum? Momo, momentum, exactly, exactly. They don't do that. They don't try to catch falling knives. They don't try to call tops. They bet with the momentum because they are the momentum. They're the ones that create it, right? They, they don't They don't want to come in and try to fade the rest of the market. It rarely, rarely ever works out, so that's why they don't do it. Okay, so I automatically will tell myself, all right, this is very clearly a, a speculative bet, right? They're not coming in here and trying to fade this move lower. So then I need to figure out if <clears throat> the risk and reward of this trade lines up with what I'm comfortable with. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Oh my gosh. Give me one second, guys. <coughs> <coughs> I apologize for that. <clears throat> I, <clears throat> our office is here in Chicago, and I live in Chicago, and this summer has been a string of 60-degree and rainy days, and I feel like I've been sick the entire time. So I apologize for my generally uh, cold, coldy-sounding head. Um, but <clears throat> after I determine that it's an opening position and that it's a speculative bet, then I need to figure out if the rest of the trade – uh, jives with um, what it is that fits into my general risk tolerance and reward preferences for my overall trading plan. So I never risk more than 5% of my book in any given equity options trade that's based on unusual options activity. Okay, So in this trade, because it's just long puts, I know what my downside is. I can't lose more than what I paid for the puts. So I know that if I buy them for 31 cents, I cannot lose more than 31 cents. It's super, super easy for me to size up this trade to fit into my risk parameters. All right. Now, this isn't really something that's that much of a concern unless you trade with a smaller account. Okay. Because what if you see an unusual options activity trade in an, uh, a call that was bought for two bucks? Right. I always take my positions in fours, at, in multiples of four, or something that I can break up into pieces to exit. If I want to do that. Um, but I don't want to risk more than 5% of my account. If I only have $5,000 in my account and I see an option trading for two bucks, well, I can't do that, right? I can't do that. So it doesn't fit into my profile. It's something that I cannot trade, all right? But here, I know right away what my risk is. It's very well defined. My reward is very well defined as well, all right? I can determine whether or not I want to use a stop or not based on my level of experience with trading and usual options activity. If you're a beginner, you know, you're not so used to trading this way. You don't really know yet exactly. Uh, you're not an expert at determining whether or not an order is a speculative bet or a hedge. So you should probably be using a pretty tight stop. 20% is completely reasonable for this type of thing. Right? You're not risking too much money, and you're still giving yourself a little bit of wiggle room. Intermediate traders can use a little bit more. Me, I never use stops. Right? So what I will do, rather than buying 100 options for a dollar with a stop at 50 cents, I'd rather just buy 50 for a dollar and risk the whole thing because then I give myself the opportunity to add on pullbacks. I give myself the chance to do a lot with <clears throat> the um, uh, trade after I've been into it, right? I want to give myself more wiggle room, okay? Then <clears throat> we need to consider time and target. So time and target fit in with the unusual options activity trading plan. It's there to remind me that I am not going to bet against the institutional trader. So what do I mean by that? So if I see January options being bought <clears throat> in some stock and unusual options activity and it passes through every other part of this little test that I have here, I like it. I determine that it's a, a speculative bet. I like the risk and reward setup. And I decide that I want to take the trade. Well, then... I need to make sure that I'm doing the same trade, okay? I can see these out in January, and I can also see that if I buy the ones that are expiring in August that they're much cheaper. But remember, the hedge fund trader, the institutional trader, has done a lot more work to get to this idea, to this point, than we ever possibly could. So if I try to buy a different option, if I try to buy a different expiration, a cheaper strike, if I try to do a spread, if I do something weird to try and save myself some money, well, then I'm basically flying in the face of all of the reasons why I am doing this in the first place. I'm basically saying, yeah, I care about looking at all this order flow because of X, Y, and Z, but forget about that. I'm just going to do my own thing now, right? So I want to trade the exact same time, same expiration, and the exact same target strike price as the institutional trader, okay? Let's take a look what happened here in MVI. So the stock continued to lower, to uh, move lower. The puts exploded in value. These things absolutely ripped higher as the stock continued to fall. <clears throat> and since then have traded as high as um, $3. So these were, went to about 10 times their value as the stock continued lower. A trader who bought a 20 lot of these puts would have made 
$5,380 on $620 worth of risk if they would have held to the highs. I bought these puts and I, <laughs> I'm not ashamed to say I didn't hold them to the highs. I didn't, I got out way earlier. I sold these things um, for a huge profit, but nothing like um, a uh, 10 bagger, right? I, I didn't, I didn't get that much. I, I took targets um, much, much uh, lower than the, than that $3 high, but it was still an incredibly profitable trade. All right, so <clears throat> I want to take all of your guys' uh, questions in here, everything here, but just give me one second to tell you guys a little bit about what some of our other customers have had to say about trading unusual options activity with us. Carol said, I know I've said this at least a few times before that I've had my best day ever in KOTM. Today I sold 50 craft April 67 half calls for a massive, massive profit. I sold some of the open and the rest a few hours later. When I said I was trading fives and I am now trading fifties and hundreds. I was afraid to enter trades, but now I learned how to trade different strategies. Thank you, Team K. OTM, I have a lot of courage now to trade emotionless and trade decisions faster. Matt said, trading with KOTM has been very, very good to me, and this is our most successful customer last year, made over $1 million trading unusual options activity using this same trading plan. So what I want to offer you guys today is the chance to come to our unusual options activity trading plan workshop that we are going to be hosting. Oh, wow, and I, I don't even have the date in here. I apologize for that. Uh, that we are going to be hosting live in a room just like this on August 13th at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. All right, it's going to be live. So in this workshop, we're going to go in depth into all of the stuff that we just just talked about, why call buying is not always bullish and put buying is not always bearish, what to look for in different uh, to differentiate between speculative order flow and hedging order flow, exactly what every single type of order is going to look like as it comes across the tape, how to determine whether a position is opening or closing, how to use the Oak Ribbit trading plan to look for open interest, <clears throat> um, chart levels, risk reward and break evens and determine if these signals are going to be trades that I actually want to get involved in and how to read <clears throat> options volume versus open interest and why average stock volume is important to an unusual options activity trader. For those of you out there that maybe aren't quite as comfortable with options, we're going to talk about how you can actually use unusual options activity order flow to trade stock, and we're going to offer this to you guys for only $97, which is 80% off our regular price. If you go to our website, you'll see that we never offer courses for less than $497 or $499, and we're offering you guys a huge, huge discount opportunity to get in and take this workshop. So I'm going to put the link in here for you guys. It's optionsonthefloor.com slash today. I'm going to put it in the uh, question box here and in the chat box. So the recording will be uh, the recording sh uh, will be sent out. It is recorded. We did record it. I'm not, I apologize. It seems like a lot of people had trouble with the sound, and I apologize for that. But you will be given a recording. So in this workshop, <clears throat> it'll be live on the 13th. That is a Thursday night at 8 p.m. Eastern time. Um, it's going to be about three hours long, right? It's going to be about three hours long, and I'm going to stay there as long as it takes to answer all of your guys' questions after the workshop. So you get an extensive, extensive live Q&A session after the workshop is over with, and then you also get a recording of the workshop to keep forever. So you'll always have access to the recording of the workshop. All right, and just like every single other workshop that we do, if you take the workshop, you come on the 13th, you watch, you watch the whole thing, you watch the recording, you decide that you don't like it or you didn't get $97 worth of value or information out of it, well then we don't want your $97 and we will give you back your money, no questions asked, okay? So essentially what I've offered you is the opportunity to take a trade here, purchase the workshop, if it doesn't work out, you get your money back, right? Risk-free trade. If I could do that, I would do that every single time, no questions asked. No questions asked. And this is exactly what I'm offering you guys right now. And yes, Carl, the workshop will be recorded, optionsonthefloor.com slash today. Um, this is a workshop that will be, like I said, probably about three hours long. It's typically about how long they run. It really all depends on how many questions you guys ask. But yes, this does have a money back guarantee. And like all of our other workshops, it will be recorded. So does anyone have any questions at all? Any questions about the workshop? How long is the offer on for? Well, we're only offering 25 spots to this group here. So 
after those are gone, they're gone, and you will not be able to take the workshop. If you have any interest at all in trading in usual options activity, um, this is the workshop for you guys. <clears throat> I really, yes, it will absolutely be recorded. I really, really don't, you know, I don't, I'm not the type of person that likes to brag, but this is what we do. This is our speci specialty here, unusual options activity, right? <clears throat> Everyone that works here in this office <clears throat> gets requests from reporters from Bloomberg, from uh, the Associated Press, from CNBC all the time to comment on unusual options activity trades. It's what they have us on live TV to talk about. It's what they have us write about as well for all of these magazine outlets. This is what we know. So if you have any interest at all in learning unusual options activity, this is the course for you. And like I said, I'm so confident that you guys are going to love the workshop, love the presentation, that if you don't have a, you know, positive experience with it, if you don't like it and you don't think you got enough value out of it, we'll give you back your money. Okay? Uh, in the options, grids only. Where do you find the information that we are translating today? Uh, the arrows, open interest phrases you had us look at. Oh, okay. So, yeah, the um, uh, scanner that we use is called Trade Alert. Okay? So, this is a scanner that it costs money. I, I pay a monthly, a monthly fee for this. Right? And it just spits out all the trades during the day. But in the workshop, what we're going to go over is uh, various ways that you can get this information uh, without having to have something, a tool like that. So one thing that we use, and I'm sorry, it's taking me a second to pull it up here. So one that we use here is uh, the Thinkorswim tool called Option Hacker. This is completely free. It comes with the Thinkorswim platform. Um, and they have something called the Sizzle Index. And that basically will show me all of the uh, stocks that have had unusual options activity that day. And in the workshop, we're going to go through uh, how you can refine this and use this a little bit uh, better. I mean, like, you see RMP is at the top of the list here. And Trade Alert will show me that. It traded 169 times its average daily equity options volume today. Okay. And I can go in and refine this and, and get this list down to way, way smaller. So then I can go and do a little bit of investigation as to what the trade was. <clears throat> so, yeah. And I believe, and I'm not super familiar with TradeStation, but I've been told by everyone that uh, has taken this workshop in the past that TradeStation has a uh, similar tool to that that lets you lets you kind of find that type of stuff. What if you're in the UK? Um, I don't know of any scanners that scan European derivatives markets, but you know, I, can you not trade American options in in the US, or can you not trade American options in the UK? <clears throat> I mean, all of the examples that we're going to do are you know be based on US listed equity options but you know this anyone in the world can subscribe to uh, to to any of these scanners or, or you know get that information uh, to make make that information available to them it, I you know I, I'm not so sure that you're able to trade uh, it though there I'm not certain how those rules work <clears throat> so any other questions guys any other questions any other questions <clears throat> Yes, the workshop will absolutely be recorded. Absolutely, absolutely. Where is the option workshop located? It's going to be in a, a room just like this. It's going to be in a GoToWebinar room just like this. So as soon as you make your purchase, you're sent the, a link to uh, register for the workshop, and then you're all set, and I'll see you on the 13th. You can trade U.S. options um, uh, in the U.K. Thank you, Patrick. So options on the floor.com slash today. If you guys want to learn more about unusual options <clears throat> activity. So any questions, guys? Any questions? Any other questions? Is that all you concentrate on unusual option activity? Uh, no, I mean, I, you know, I, I trade a number of different strategies. Unusual option activity is definitely my bread and butter. Yeah, we offer a trading room. I actually believe that if you uh, take this offer, there is a chance to purchase a trading room trial subscription afterwards. I'm not 100% sure, though. But um, uh, <clears throat> uh, I trade a lot of different strategies. This workshop is only is going to focus on unusual options activity, but in the workshop, we're not just going to talk about how I use this information to trade options, because you could actually use the order flow that you get from uh, following the UOA 
to trade stock as well, right? So think about it. Think about this, and I'll, I guess I'll kind of give you guys one of these for free. <laughs> so we then, you know, just like a really quick explanation. So this is one of the topics that we're going to talk about here, and this is uh, something that you can apply to stuff outside of equity options. So let's say that I have a stock that trades uh, 250,000 shares a day, and a trader comes in and buys 10. Thousand out of the money calls in that stock, right? Well, the market maker that sold them those calls is now short calls. What does the market maker who short calls have to do to hedge themselves? Well, they have to buy stock. How much stock do they have to buy if they sold 10,000 calls? Well, it depends on the delta. Let's say that they were out of the money and they only had a 20 delta. Well, that market maker has to buy 200,000 shares of stock in order to hedge himself. Once he starts buying that stock, when the stock only trades a quarter million shares a day, what do you guys think is going to happen to the stock? goes higher right so I can make money by trading the option I can you know trade the stock I can do a lot of different things with that information once I know how the stock and options markets behave with each other uh, triple D 743 contracts over 22 in open interest is that an example of unusual option activity? Absolutely not. Not even close. <laughs> I, that's that's not even close because Triple D. Take a look at this. I mean, Triple D trades a ton of options in a day and a ton of stock in a day. So think about this. The um, uh, stock traded today. The stock traded today 3.1 million shares of stock. How many options? How many shares of stock does 700 contracts give a trader control over? Only 7,000 shares. So is that of significance at all, considering the fact that Triple D trades 3.1 million shares? No. Oh, I'm sorry, 70,000. Yeah, 700, not 70. No, it doesn't. It's a drop in the bucket. An absolute drop in the bucket. You're in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Where am I located? Chicago, Illinois. How frequently do we see trades like these? Every single day. <laughs> Every single day there is unusual options activity. Because think about it like this, guys. The hedge fund never stops trading, right? They they trade they trade all all the time. And what's great about UOA is that if I'm someone who wants to pay attention to day trade setups, well then I can focus on the very short dated unusual option activity that comes across the tape. If I'm someone who wants to trade longer term setups, well then I will focus on the longer term options that come across the tape. If I want to trade swing trades, I focus on the middle term, you know, three to six month out options that <clears throat> come across the tape. All right? So any other questions, guys? Any other questions? Are there, is there a graphical way? No, there really isn't. I mean, yeah, there's like heat maps and stuff, but they don't really give you the information that you would need um, to do this. So any other questions, guys? Any other questions? <clears throat> I am going to go ahead and stop the recording right now, just in the interest of having a short usable recording here. I will stay I will stay here and continue to answer questions though. So thank you guys very much for coming. Everyone have a fantastic evening and as always happy trading. So I'm still here. I just stopped the recording. So Steven you're in Pennsylvania. I like I are in uh, Philly. I like Philly. I had friends that lived out there for a while. I've I went out there a couple times. Cool <clears throat> I went to one of the, uh, my, the the coolest bars I've ever been to uh, anywhere in Philadelphia. <clears throat> Any other questions, guys? Any other questions? Thank you, Patrick. So I see several of you have taken the offer already here, so if you guys are interested, please do not delay. I don't want to... I don't want some of you guys to, you know, I don't want you guys to try and purchase and then realize that there's no more spots left. I actually have no control over when this link dies. So, um, you know, if you're interested, please take advantage of it now. Like we said, we have a money back guarantee. So, <clears throat> so any other questions, guys? Any other questions? Any other questions? 
how do you get involved and not have to wait to August 13th? <laughs> um, so, I mean, for, for one, I mean, you know, we have a lot of, you know, there's a lot of different stuff that you can do with us. We have a lot of stuff on our website, but I, you know, if you want to learn how to, if you want to trade unusual option activity, this is the workshop that, you know, is kind of the thing that you would need to get, to get primed and get started. So, I mean, you know, if you're interested in, in getting involved before that, you can uh, go to our website, shoot us an email, but I still would highly recommend that you take the course as well. It kind of frames up everything that we do in a nice, you know, little bundle so you can wrap your head around it and understand kind of the ins and outs of uh, the way that we trade and everything that we, we look at and use on a daily basis. So any other questions, guys? Any other questions? Any other questions? Any other questions? Any other questions? You were in Chicago a while back for four days and really enjoyed it. Everyone enjoyed visiting here. <laughs> I, lo I love it here. I've I mean, I've lived here my whole life, though. So, <clears throat> where'd you stay at, Stephen? How big of an account do you need to benefit from the workshop? No, I mean that that that's the, the wrong way to think about it. Think about it like this. That MBI trade that we went over, those were trading for 31 cents, right? So if I bought a 10 lot of those, how much risk would I have had on um in that trade? $310. Right? So I mean, I can I can t carry $310 in risk in, you know, even a, a $5,000 account and be comfortable with that. Right? Sure. Holiday Inn. This is the this is supposed to be tourist season here in Chicago. <clears throat> our uh, our mayor has made a very uh, concerted effort to try and get tourism to over 70 million this season, but uh, the weather is not cooperating. It's been awful. <laughs> I was gonna go watch a uh, I was gonna go see a, uh, some live music on the lake tonight, but it's looking like it's gonna rain, and I don't think. Uh, that's going to happen anymore. So any other questions, guys? Any other questions? Seems like uh, most of the questions are slowing down here. Any other questions? <clears throat> Alrighty guys, so <clears throat> with that, I think I'm going to say goodbye and bid you all adieu. Thank you all for coming. Um, <clears throat> you guys had some really good questions throughout the presentation. I really appreciate that. It makes it a lot easier for me to uh, go through all this stuff and kind of uh, you know, do so without uh, <laughs> feeling like it's dragging or anything. So thank you guys very much. Yes, oh, thank you, and I'm looking forward to giving it. So a lot of, people, a lot of you guys took the, uh, took the offer here. Thank you very much. I'll try. A lot of you guys took the offer here, so uh, thank you very much. We'll see all of you on uh, the 13th at 8 p.m. Eastern time for the workshop. Um, if you guys are interested in the workshop but you cannot be there at that time, if that time doesn't work for you, you should still take the offer because we'll be giving you the, work, uh, the workshop recording that you'll have access to forever after that. All right? We haven't done this uh, particular workshop in quite some time, so I don't expect we'll be doing it for quite some time after this either. So I would imagine that the spots that we do have are going to go pretty quickly. So feel free to shoot me an email if you guys have any other questions. I'm going to put my email address in here as well, james at keenonthemarket.com. And I'll see all of you there.
Everyone have a fantastic evening, and as always, happy trading.